All right, guys, today I've got the Caliph of Shitlords, the Emir of the Patriarchy, Sargon of Akkad. How are you, sir? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good, good. You're looking off, I think, maybe a bit thinner and tanned, Oops. rested. You're apparently on vacation, correct? I was. I was in uh, lovely Spain. Oh, very nice. How long were you there for? Uh, only a week. Oh, uh, very well. well welcome back. I just wanted, for, 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 the, for the few people who don't know who you are, I wanted to uh, contextualize sort of your background. You run a very, very successful YouTube channel with, I think, over 300,000 uh, f uh, subscribers, roughly yeah. 10 times the size of my channel, as I salivate like a Pavlovian dog with envy. Uh, I think 77 plus million views. So you've certainly built an incredibly successful platform. You tackle bad ideas. You're a skeptic. You're, you're a rational guy. Uh, and of course, you've found a, a great niche from which to uh, expand your ideas. So I actually first heard of you through the YouTube connections. And I think I might have reached out to you and you were kind enough to invite me on your show. So, Oh, yeah, you. I was I was quite thrilled to hear from an evolutionary psychologist because <laughs> it was obviously the antithesis of an SJW professor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They, 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 they wander around denying biology constantly. So I was like, oh, really? A, a man who's interested in acknowledging biology? That's interesting. You're right. Well, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Continue, continue. Well, that's all I was going to say, really. I, I had to get you on because, my goodness, we need some... We need some academic voices in opposition to these people, don't we? Oh, listen, I've been, I've been fighting that, that good fight for over 20 years in academia. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure if we had touched on this on your show, but, uh, you know, you definitely see that there is lesser resistance, right? I mean, this is just part of the autocorrective process of science. Bad ideas die out uh, eventually. Uh, but you still have folks that are very dogged in their opposition to EP, and I guess if you want, we can take it up now. I mean, I had it later in my list, but uh, several okay. people wrote to me saying that you had invited, uh, I don't know who she is, but some, a, a feminist, uh, uh, is it, is it uh, Chris, Christy Winters? Is that right? Yes, Dr. Christy Winters. Dr. Yeah. Christy Winters. And uh, some people had written to me saying, hey, I'd like you to watch uh, the chat that uh, Sargon had with this uh, scholar and, uh, you know, rebuke. And, and unfortunately, I just didn't have the time. So maybe you can give me a sense of what she might have said as relating to EP, so I could trash her into oblivion <laughs> as we speak. Um, that's it's an interesting one. Um, I, I, I can't, you know, I didn't, that's not what stood out in my mind from, okay. the, de, from the debate we had. I mean, it wasn't my finest hour or anything. But the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that she defined feminism as an ideology at the start, and then by the end she was trying to define feminism as a methodology by saying any act of, say, women's rights activism is a feminist act. I'm thinking, wow, that's so arrogant. And obviously counter to what she's already defined it as, so dumb. But uh, can, you, can you even imagine that? You know, it's not like, you know, like any, any act of charity towards a Jewish person is an act of Zionism or something like that. You know, it's, it's crazy. And it's hegemonic. And obviously it was just the point at which, like, any kind of dialogue kind of stopped because I was just flat out saying, well, no. It's an ideology. You defined it as an ideology. It's not a methodology. You're obviously vastly overreaching here. Well, what amazes me, I mean, speaking of overreach, I mean, we, we both can agree, and I think most reasonable people can agree, that feminism as a movement to create equality, blah, 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 is, is perfectly reasonable, and we should all be supporting that. The problem is when it starts overreaching, as you said, whereby we now need to have feminist mathematics, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, right, I mean, I, I studied mathematics, and so I get the sense that the reality in mathematics is truly independent of one's identity. It doesn't matter what gender you identify as, the distribution of prime numbers will be the distribution of prime numbers. But apparently, no, yeah. that is sexist, that is uh, phobic, that is transphobic. Crazy. And, and we need to, so there's feminist, as you probably know, it's, it's made its way around, feminist glaciology, there's yep. feminist chemistry. And so you, you truly wonder, I mean, as somebody who obviously studies the human mind, I'm, I'm, I always ask this question, and I'll ask it to you. Do you believe that in the deep res recesses of their minds, they actually believe this BS, or it's just part of a grand sort of identity politics delusion, but, they, but deep down they know that they're bullshitting? I think on a subconscious level, they probably know they're bullshitting. Right. Uh, but the thing is, I think there's... There's this kind of habit when people start buying into an ideology, they start sort of building up a foundation of things that they believe. And then on that foundation, they build up another layer 
that requires the foundation to exist. So if they want that layer to continue to exist, which they inevitably will do, if someone attacks the foundation, they have to defend it regardless of the truth of the defense. And then I think feminists are basically like three layers up. So now they're, they're, they're teetering on all white people are racist, all men are sexist, all straight people are homophobes and all that sort of nonsense. And to get to that point, they've had to build up a, a, a foundation of well, ridiculous half-truths and lies to get to this point. And now they can't undo any of it without the original assertion of you're a racist, you're a sexist just because you're a white man or whatever. They can't, they can't undo any of that. And so any criticism you give them, they have to say no to. Because otherwise it forces them to reevaluate their entire worldview. And nobody wants to reevaluate their entire worldview. That's a scary prospect. Because people's worldview informs their morality. You know, if, and, and everyone wants to be moral. Even the people who aren't necessarily what I would consider moral. They think they're doing the right thing in some way. And they've got their own justifications for it. And when you force someone to reevaluate their entire worldview, if they do that and find that every moral act they've taken now is actually an immoral act. They have to bear the, like, the emotional and like, moral cost of that. They have to look at themselves and go, oh shit, I need to apologize to a lot of people. Right. And it's a lot easier to deny reality than it is to go back and do that. Well, and I think the difficulty is that when you try to challenge them on point, because it becomes a form of quasi-religious thinking that is sort of immune to to reason, to evidence, any mm. amount of evidence that you give them, they're impervious to it. So, I, what, so I'll give you one example, but of course there are a million. I, I, I did a sad truth clip a while ago where I took data from the U.S. Education Department, I can't remember the exact source, uh, where they had looked at every degree, so an associate's degree, which is about half a bachelor's, bachelor's mm. degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, across five racial groups in the US, so there, are, there were 20 cells that they could look at, and in every single of the 20 cells, women outnumbered men in terms of obtaining their degrees. So I mean, you couldn't make up data that was more in favor <laughs> or against sort of the patriarchal yeah. stuff. So whenever you give this information, the rebuttal will typically be, yes, but at Princeton and the math department, as at full professor level, there are more men than women, therefore, aha, patriarchy still exists. So, so it's really, it's just a form of quasi-religious thinking, right? Yeah, it is, absolutely. And the, the funny thing about that is, by their own logic then, men are institutionally oppressed and therefore cannot be sexist. So a man could run around doing practically anything he wanted to women, saying anything he wanted, acting whatever way he wanted, and they wouldn't be allowed to criticize him by SJW logic. Right. Obviously, it's nonsense, but th this, this is the sort of innate hypocrisy of it. Suddenly, they get to the end of their ideology and realize that, oh, I mean, we've been so successful. Now we're the majority. We're the ones with the institutional power. Oh, dear. You know, now we have to criticize ourselves. And again, they don't want to do that. You know, they, it's, you know that's the, that's, they absolutely want to keep pushing and pushing for hegemony. And then they will start denying reality. They'll right. start making up excuses. This is... This is why I see SJWs on Twitter all the time saying things like uh, Barack Obama is the face of whiteness. I'm just like, I just, <laughs> you know, the, the white supremacy has put a black president into power. Why? Oh, now they have to now they have to think of a conspiracy theory. And I thought, oh, well, it's to, it's to keep us all in line. It's it's to prevent us from seeing how oppressed we are and all this. It's oh, really, really, you can name one person who's doing that. Name one person who thinks that, you know, and Barack Obama was elected. He wasn't appointed, you know, so it's not like there was a great white supremacist patriarchal conspiracy somewhere where we all got together, decided, right, we're going to vote for Barack Obama to keep the black people down. You know, it's the most ridiculous well, I, thing. Well, right? ISIS are really Jews pretending to be Muslim, right? Uh, so, <laughs> that's commitment. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's, I mean, it's really, it's a fascinating uh, issue to study because really it's a form of, well, it's a virus of the mind. And I've, I've used this biological uh, metaphor in the past or uh, analogy where you basically, in the same way that when you have pneumonia, I mean, there is literally a bacterium that has infected your lungs, right? Yes. And so there is a virus of the mind that comes in that parasitizes your ability to think uh, in a quasi-religious form. And so, it, so then you, 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 you succumb to all of the stuff that is typically uh, expected of faith-based 
quote thinking, yeah. right? You're yeah. impervious to reason, you're impervious to evidence, you're conspiratorial, it's all faith-based. And so in a sense, I think what we both do in our public outreach programs is that we try mm. to battle bad ideas, right? I mean, it, Oh, it, absolutely. That's I think that's the first thing that needs doing. And the thing is that this isn't anything new either. Um in uh was it Plato or no, sorry, Aristotle's politics. He talks about how Socrates and people like him with they were, they were literally a class of people who got paid by the public to debunk bad ideas. People just wanted to hear these bad ideas debunked. They're now, they it's now this, called Patreon account. It, exactly, you know, and they, they, people knew that these things were wrong, you know, this this sort of nonsense that's being preached on the street corner by some guy who's quite kind of charismatic and getting a bit of a following. And uh, they would go and take the argument to um, uh, someone who followed the Socratic method, basically, and ask them to debunk it. And they would, you know, they would pay them. It's very similar to what I do, really. And I didn't even, I, I only read politics uh, about a month ago. So I, I hadn't even considered that this is something that is timeless, almost. You know, I mean, we just have a, a much greater reach because of, God bless the internet. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that's always been done. And I can understand why, because bad ideas, like you say, they're a virus. They can pass... From person to person, if someone doesn't know it's a bad idea and they sold it as a good idea, why wouldn't they pass it on? Well, you know, they they can't help but do it. You want you want to spread good ideas. That's you know that's that's part of the human condition. Let's see if we can improve things. And if you've got a mental framework that doesn't really that kind of fixes you in this rigid path of thought and doesn't allow you to take other concordant paths to as say the same conclusion, which is how you would know you're in the right, you know, then you you end up. Absolutely denying reality, just ex- excluding the reality of the situation. Because otherwise, my God, you've got to go back so far and, oh, no, no, no. It's just easier to say it doesn't exist and not think about it. So how, so, did, how did you, I mean, uh, at some point you decided, hey, I'd like to start a YouTube channel. I'd like to contribute my voice to this grand battle of ideas. What was yeah. sort of the impetus or the catalyst that got you going and, and positioning how you were going to tackle this? Um... Well, I've always been, I've always been a liberal of the sort of old sort. I've always, you know, believed in very much an in individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, secularism, science, reason. You know, the, the, I mean, I, I assumed that almost everyone was like this. You know, I, 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 I can't see an argument against it. And if I could see an argument against this kind of worldview, I'd change it. You know, I, I would be like, no, that's a, that's a fair argument. Let's, you know, I'll, ad- I'll adapt what I have to do to adapt to incorporate that argument. But I don't see any, I, I, I think we are looking at the best arguments there, you know, which is why we do them. And so when I saw, I, I would just see on, on a, on, it started as sort of like a, a once a, once twice a week, I'd read a paper and see something that I was like, oh, that's ridiculous, you know. Um, but, and then I'd see it more and more. And then occasionally I'd see people on TV saying, I'd be like, Christ, I can't believe how far these bad ideas are going. And it got to the point where I was really genuinely worried in a lot of ways, thinking, Christ, if we carry on on the path we're going... We're going to lose the civilization that I, I treasure, you know, I, the, the sort of the, the ethos that I think is really important and, and has brought us to the, the greatness that we're at now. You know, we don't we have all of this because of the things that I'm trying to support. And I, I think that I think that a lot more people would support them as well if they knew what was going on. But a lot of the things that we deal with are behind closed doors. I mean, like you were saying about the feminist glaciology the other day, I someone was like, you won't believe this. And I, I, I saw it and I thought, I don't believe that. So I Googled queer geography on Google Scholar. <laughs> Dozens of articles. Dozens. What the hell is queer geography? I, I've actually, just let me interject. I actually had the great misfortune of sitting on a committee at one point a couple of years ago where I had to uh, go over grant applications. Uh, and many, for whatever reason, I had been assigned a whole bunch of these grant applications that were very much postmodernist and bent. And so all that querying of the space and querying of urban was all, that's all I read. And so I think I might have even tweeted about it because when I came out of that exercise, I was very close to committing suicide. <laughs> See, I, th- I think postmodernism is basically the sort of natural reaction psychologically as a defense mechanism to reality, mm. you know, where they've, they've got their ideology. People can point out that reality doesn't work. It's like, well, I need to invent a way of discrediting whatever you're saying, no matter what it is. Right. You know, and, and postmodernism is basically that. I mean, break, I, I hate it so much. It, the, the whole philosophy seems to be about breaking everything down into categories and then declaring, oh, now everything's categorized. All of these categories are equal. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, they're not. 
you know, life is not as good as death, even though they're both states of existence. You know, and they're blah, yeah, but they're both all states. religions are equal. I, exactly, all religions are the same. You know, a Buddhist is just as dangerous as a radical Muslim. It's like, no, what are you talking about? You know, it's it's nonsense. It's again a denial of reality, but it's it's a way of bogging down any argument and trying to discredit anything they come across. And frankly, you've just got to ignore it. If if something is justified to the point, if if the the blocks that you're working with to get to your point that you're actually arguing are justified, and they say, well, what about this? It's like, well, how can you un, can you show me how it's not justified? And if they can't, and you can show how it is justified, just ignore their criticism because they are just trying this critical theory nonsense on you. They are not trying to have a constructive dialogue. They're just trying to get you bogged down improving things that you have proven on your way up there. And if it's not proven, you can't use it, obviously. You know, I'm not saying don't be critical, don't be skeptical. I'm saying don't be unreasonable. You know, if something is justified and it is tangibly better than the alternative, choose that thing. You know, just that, that's, that's my advice for dealing with critical theory. So I've done a few clips dealing with uh, postmodernism, the larger rubric of postmodernism. And most recently, just a few, a few clips ago, I just read the abstract of a postmodernist article that was just hilarious. Uh, I mean, it was hilarious in the sense of uh, just the sort of the salad of nonsensical gibberish words. Now, most people, uh, you know, would watch such a clip and say, wow, I, I, I can't believe that you even could get through such garbage. Yeah. And now a few people, their blowback was, well, you're such an asshole because, I mean, <laughs> if you were to read a physics paper or a math paper, you wouldn't necessarily know what's in that language. So again, the argument is, it's not that it's just a concatenation of random gibberish, but rather there is an inherent profundity. There is a language there, and I'm just too lazy and stupid to actually understand it, Where when I clearly know that it is random generated bullshit. I mean, we've got random generator POMO sites, right, that satirize yeah. this whole thing, right? Uh, but again, you see the type of dishonest, intellectual dishonest blowback where they're trying to compare, right? I mean, I mean, physics has a language, math has a language, and so postmodernism has an equally profound, impenetrable language. No, it's bullshit, and future historians will look at this as a cancer that 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 has infected thousands and thousands of students. Absolutely. I mean, this, the SoCal affair is just the nail in the coffin of postmodernism. Yeah. Uh, if, for anyone who's not familiar, um, a physicist, I think it was. Yes, it was. It was, yeah. He, he wrote a paper designed to sound as if it was a credible postmodern paper, but obviously nonsense. By the gravity, right? It was, postmo it was a postmodernist uh, exploration of gravity. That's right, yeah. It, obviously demonstrably nonsense. If you just looked at the definition of each word in the title, nonsense. You know, But they're complicated words, they're... Like you say, it's very opaque. It's very difficult to read if you're not some sort of professional postmodernist, basically. Um, and so, yeah, he, he managed to fictionalize this article, total horse crap, and sent it off to a journal, a scientific journal. And they looked at it and said, oh, that's fantastic. And they published it. He then, on the day it was published, went to a different magazine and gave them an interview saying, well, they've published this article that I wrote that was nonsense as a test to see if nonsense could get through on the basis of it just sounding postmodern. And their defense was, well, we took something from it. It was just unbelievable. You can't like, falsify the bastard. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's subjective, unfalsifiable, anti-scientific nonsense. I actually... So, me, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your thought. Sorry, I've got a noise coming through. I don't know whether it's my, my uh, phone or not. No, I don't think it is. Sorry. Oh, by um, the way, I'm yeah, offended. Is that, is that a cross? My Judaism is offended by your cross. Is there a cross behind you? Th there is. I oh, went to, that, um... that is very anti-Semitic, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was in Spain, I went to um, the uh, Basilica of Montserrat. Uh, gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. And I wanted a memento. So I got... Uh, it's a uh, very nice um, the marble uh, prayer beads, rosary. Yeah. And I think, by the way, you showing this in a conspicuous manner during the holy month of Ramadan <laughs> is clearly Islamophobic. Yeah, Please it's, it's definitely anti-Muslim. Yeah. I'm not going to yes. lie. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, go on, go on. You want to finish your point on postmodernism? Well, yeah, yeah. So, um, basically, postmodernism is obvious nonsense. And we, we see the same sort of thing with uh, a blogger called Sandy Beaches and feminism. Uh, this, this chap called Sandy, he, he used the pseudonym Sandy Beaches. He started writing what sounded like feminist articles, 
and sending them off to popular feminist publications like Salon and Huffington Post and places like this. And they started publishing them and paying him for them. And then he wrote this blog post saying, look, I've been doing this for like six months. It's all nonsense. I've been making it, off, making it up off the top of my head. And they just thought it sounded believable. And so publish it. It's, you know, there's no intellectual rigor. It's all confirmation bias. They hear something, oh, that sounds like I, something I would agree with. So let's publish it. It's, it propagandizes people towards feminism. And so, yeah, the, there's no intellectual rigor. There's no, there's no, the, it's, like you say, it's unfalsifiable. You know, I actually and, had a chat, uh, I mean, an email exchange with, with Sokal at one point. Oh, because, really? Yeah, because I had written, and actually, I, I think I'd like to have him on my show if he's... You if should, I'd love to have a chat to him. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm going back now a few years ago, I had written a Psychology Today article uh, describing, the, you know, this whole postmodernist stuff and giving some of my own personal anecdotes, navigating through some of these bullshitters, and, and communicating with him. I think I had used the word, like, you know, oh, it was amazing how you gen generated all this random bullshit. To which he sort of took exception. He said, actually, that gibberish that I created was really thought out. So don't <laughs> call it. Right? So so it was gibberish, but yeah. just don't call it random gibberish. Yeah, I yeah it was deliberate of, gibberish. It, it, right. It was deliberate yeah, yeah. in my creating nonsense. So please correct yourself. I said, okay, I'm corrected. Fine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I stand corrected on <laughs> that one, sir. You know, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, that's fantastic, though. You know, and I, 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 I bet he would just get chewed out if he did that today. Yeah, because he did it in the late nineties, didn't he? Yeah, I think it was maybe ninety six, ninety seven. But my feeling yeah. is, and and some people have agreed with me, others haven't, and I'm sure there must be some empirical way to test this by looking at journal publications, and so on. My feeling is that that's on its, I mean, not on its way out necessarily, but it reached its zenith, I would say, fifteen twenty years ago. So so that while there still are many people who like the glaciology paper, there, so we can still find tons of pomo nonsense. I I'd like to think that the sort of fulcrum is starting to swing the other way. Is that your sense, or do you know enough to be able to pronounce a position? Well, I mean, I would hope that's the case. But the thing is, I, I do I do despair for the state of academia at the moment. The The social sciences have a lot of problems. You know, I, I mean, I'm not the sort of person who thinks social science can't have validity. I think, of course, you know, you do studies, you, you do, you know, scientific polls, you get representative samples you can draw accurate conclusions i think that's a great thing but the problem is that these people often start with the conclusion and then poll to get it i mean there are, there are many 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 problems with a lot of the things that social science does for example a lot of them do online polls which are often shared through social media networks now these people are extremely left extremely left i mean i'm, I'm a leftist but these people are like way to the left and much to the the authoritarian side and so they, they have habits. There was a study done that uh, basically showed that liberals are, are much less likely to have friends outside of, that, outside of that ideological grouping, which means that if, say, and obviously college campuses for social science are incredibly liberal. I mean, most of them are very liberal anyway, but the, these things are almost exclusively liberal. I mean, Republican professors in universities in America are a tiny minority. Try sociology departments. Uh, yeah, exactly. They probably don't even exist in those, you know. And so when these people pass around these polls... They're polling liberal students on a liberal campus with a liberal social network. And obviously, this is not an accurate representative sample. This is, at best, a sample of what these people think. You know, it's, you know, maybe what liberals think, but it's certainly not representative of the population as a whole. And they don't seem to care. The, I, it, this was one of the things in the debate with Christy Winters. I, I brought this up. She didn't address it. And I was just like, well, you know, your, your data is unreliable. That's the, I mean, fundamentally, it's this is not a very scientific way of accumulating strong data. The, the, the best you're going to say here is that I have very weak data that might indicate. But then they will extrapolate conclusions from that. And they'll always, I, honestly, in, during Gamergate, we, um, we saw many, many social scientists doing these polls and studies and stuff. And then they would, they would come out with a, a paper. Um, it would be peer-reviewed by people in their peer group. So... I mean, and they, they would literally have feminist peer review sites that they would do these peer reviews on. And I was looking at them. Um, I can't remember the name of the one I was, I was most baffled by. But um, the peer review was basically spell checking. <laughs> and I was just like, I was looking through the notes along the side to see what they were, what they were suggesting that needed to be fixed. And it was mostly spelling and grammar. And I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> that's conformity for you, I suppose. But the, the studies that they were doing... One of the, the, the main one that started Gamergate, the, the justification for, well, most people aren't gamers, so we can just declare gamers are over, 
was done, I think it was uh, 32 people. A, a whole 32 people to represent the gaming industry. And I was just staggered. Just, wow. That's the least representative sample of anything. You know, a, a, a few SJWs on a liberal college campus are not representative of gamers. You know, so it's absurd. So they, they were like, oh, well, you know, only 30% of these people claim, claim they were gamers. So most people aren't gamers. And it's like, yes, that's how it works. You know, well well done. That's, that's not nonsense, is it? But the gaming press, uni- almost universally, picked this study. Took, it, there, there was a Tumblr blog written by a gaming academic called Dan Golding, who basically had referenced this. And then another games journalist who had an art degree referenced this. And that was it. It was a cascade of information, dozens and dozens, on the same day of these websites, all ran with this article, ran with the narrative. And it was just like, wow. I mean, you, you guys couldn't be more blatant that you have an agenda to push if you tried. You've got the worst science I've ever seen. I think anyone would have ever seen. And you've just, you've just assumed it's reality. It's absolutely terrible. Let me, but let, I, this is emblematic of what happens. Right. Let, me, let me weigh in on sort of the natural versus social sciences since, sure. I, since I navigate across both groups, right? Uh, mm. As somebody who applies evolutionary theory oftentimes to study human behavior. Uh, so I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, who is a scientist, it's anybody who uses a scientific method, right? So you could use a scientific method and all of its uh, epistemology and, and, and methodology and, so, and try to tackle a physics problem or do it to tackle a sociology problem. Both are scientists. The problem with social science, science the, the social sciences, in my view, is that unlike the natural sciences that have very coherent trees of knowledge. So for example, if you take physics or chemistry or biology, there, there is a tree of knowledge that one can construct whereby the cumulative evidence that's coming in could be organized within this tree of knowledge, right? There, yeah. there, there aren't people who are uh, for the periodic table in chemistry and others who are against it. <laughs> there aren't some yeah. people who are uh, for free falling gravity, that's the term I, I, I got from uh, the dr- <laughs> Drunken Peasants uh, podcast. Yeah, right? yeah. And some who are against gravity, right? Uh, there aren't some people who believe in evolution and others who are anti-evolutionists but work in biology departments at universities. So there, there's sort of a core set of facts that everybody agrees on. Then you've got this beautiful tree of knowledge. Now, we could disagree in particular nodes, and that's why science goes on. That's why scientific debates cool. go, go on. That's it's why a process. It's, it's a not, process. There's it's never auto- going to be a finished process. It's autocorrective, right? Things that yeah. Newton said have been corrected since. But, but the difference in the social sciences is that you could create so-called knowledge bases that are perfectly disconnected from other schools of thought. Therefore, there is no jumping point from one paradigm to another. Therefore, you could be a social scientist who starts with the premise that there are no innate biological differences between men and women. Now, once you start with that premise and you're called a gender feminist or gender women, yeah. women study, right? Now, you've already sort of broken yourself off from the chain, the tree of knowledge from anybody who is biologically informed, right? And so I think that's the problem with the social sciences is that it's easier for ideologies, for viruses of the human mind to creep into the scientist's work. Whereas in the natural sciences, you don't have quite as much that possibility. Well, in the natural sciences, usually what what you're theorizing about is directly testable, isn't it? I mean... You know, if you if you had a theory about electricity, a feminist electrical theory or something, uh, you you could apply all the ideology you want. But if it doesn't work and you don't get a result, then everyone's going to be like, well, you're obviously wrong. But with social science, it's a much harder thing to do, isn't it? I mean, you know, you you can't you. I mean, what what is there necessarily to demonstrate that they're wrong? You know, it's it's a it's a long process of of observation so it depends on the phenomenon so let me give you an example and i think i I might have touched on some of these when i was on your show i mean if we were studying something like uh is facial symmetry a preferred cue across cultures well i mean there's a very very clear way that we could test this there's a very clear way that we could replicate this across many cultures and so Mm -hmm. it is it is as exact and as falsifiable as anything that you could propose in, quote, physics or chemistry. There mm. is clearly a pattern of data that would falsify the idea that facial symmetry is preferred 
or not, right? Uh, yeah. Then we could look at, well, is it true that people who are more facially symmetric uh, have better genotypes? Are they more healthy? We could test this. So, so I don't think it's necessarily true that inherently, if, you, if you're not working in physics or chemistry, you're somehow fuzzier. The problem hmm. is that people just don't, are more likely to do poor science in the social sciences. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, that, that's what I was trying to say, basically. It's like, if if you say that... Um, the, the problem, I think, that it all comes down to is a lot of it is asking people their opinions. And this is the problem. This is not an empirical data set. You know, people change their opinions. People forget what their opinion was five years ago on a subject. So if they do a study saying, do you prefer X or Y, and they say X, then next year they might say Y, you know? And, and, and the thing is this, again... How do you demonstrate that people actually said what they claim? You know, because with, with physics, someone could repeat this experiment and obviously they would get the same result or not the result, which would prove that it was incorrect or incorrect. Uh, correct. But, and, and the same with the facial symmetry. You know, you could, that's a testable thing. You could repeat it. You know, do you find this person more attractive or this person, blah, blah. But when you're asking people, you know, do you feel right. like you're threatened or something and you're asking feminists on a college campus, then whether everyone's talking about rape constantly as if there's a rape culture everywhere. Well, sure, they're going to feel damn threatened, even if the data, the, you know, the actual thing that we can look at and say, well, I mean, you say it's one in five people, but actually it's 0.03 in five. So your feelings, your opinions aren't really very useful. But you uh, saying think- that, by the way, is a form of rape. You contesting <laughs> their thing. Is a form of <laughs> epistemological rape. So you're a rapist, sir. I, I, I am so sorry. I will, I will try not to be a, a fact rapist exactly. in the future. <laughs> By the way, I received a this lot of. Thing. I received a lot of tweets, and I didn't, I didn't quite understand what the reference was to. They, they were asked people because I put out a tweet saying, "Hey, what, what would you like me to speak uh, with Sargon about?" And a lot of people made some rape jokes. What, what is all that about? It, what, no, no, they, they weren't rape jokes. They were anti-rape jokes. Oh, okay, what, um, what is this the, all about? The, there's a British MP called Jess Phillips who is a dogmatic feminist. All right. And like with all feminists, they, they tend towards victimhood. And so she has claimed that she receives nothing but rape threats on Twitter, on and on and on. And so now she's launched this campaign called Reclaim the Internet to uh, reclaim it from rape threats or something. And basically what they're asking for is oversight and control of social media. That's what they want. And I don't think they should have it. And I was very critical in a video that I did of this because I think it would be entirely unaccountable, entirely subjective, and it would end up destroying everything because that's what social justice does. Uh, it, would, it would just basically end up killing these platforms as people leave. And so I tweeted this out as saying, Jess, I wouldn't even rape you. And I, know, I was being deliberately provocative by saying that, but there's no way you can interpret that as a rape threat. Except Jess Phillips did interpret it as a rape threat. Now, you, you were saying uh, you wouldn't rape her because you don't find her attractive enough no, to rape? No, because I think or rape's because... wrong. Oh, I see. Okay, so it wasn't a jab at her person. No, okay. not at all. Okay, okay. Rape, is, rape is obviously a terrible thing to do. Obviously, it's wrong. It's deeply immoral, you know. Um, obviously illegal. Um, but the thing is, I said it in a sort of assertive way, as if I may have been saying a rape threat, because I wanted to know if she was listening to what I was saying or just reacting to how I was saying it. And this kind of went viral, actually. It it got everywhere. Suddenly, like, I mean, initially, people on Twitter just started laughing at her. You know, oh, I wouldn't rape you either, Jess. Isn't isn't that a compliment? You know, people just started taking the mick because she started acting as if these were threats when they weren't threats. And uh, and nobody really thought that much of it. We just started laughing, tweeting out, going, yeah, there are billions of women I won't rape. You know, and stuff like this, because, you know, it's just nonsense. And then... The Birmingham, she's an MP for Birmingham, and the Birmingham Mail picked up on this non-rape story, but but ran it as if she was getting rape threats, and she obviously did an interview with them, and then it got picked up by the, the, the mainstream press, and they were all saying the same thing. I mean, like, the Daily Mail, which usually isn't as bad as people say, but this was one of those cases where I was, like, shocked. They, they printed MP gets 600 rape threats in a day, and then printed a bunch of the tweets where people were saying, I won't rape you. And it was literally under the headline, and I'm just like, wow, they're not even reading it. They're, just, they're not even reading what they're printing there. And so if, eventually, it got so bad, Someone, for, a, a guy from the Times, the Sunday Times, uh, called me to interview me and see what I was saying. So I got to tell him about the regressive left and how they're not paying attention to what's going on and how this is nonsense. 
And it came to the point where, I mean, there were celebrities reporting my Twitter account to the, the Twitter authorities, to the Trust and Safety Council, which is a feminist-run council. That's the Sarkeesian stuff, right? That's where, yeah, yeah. that's what Anita Sarkeesian is involved yeah. in, right? And, uh, I mean, we, we're talk, like, um, Webb, from Mitchell and Webb, and Graham Lynham, and a few others, I think, they, they were, you know, encouraging their millions of followers to r- report my account and stuff like that. And uh, Twitter did, you know, they, they did. They sent it off to Twitter. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get banned or suspended now for not doing anything wrong. And nothing happened. And then in a, in a follow-up article in The Telegraph, Jess Phillips printed the, the response that Twitter got. These tweets do not violate our terms and conditions. You know, this was confirmation. These were not threats. You know, even Twitter with their Trust and Safety Council could see these were not threats. So Jess Phillips decided to accuse them of colluding with her abusers. And I was just like, now you're, you're accusing Anita Sarkeesian, part of the Trust and Safety Council, of colluding with people sending rape threats on Twitter. Or... You're wrong, and you're making a storm out of a teacup, and you're looking foolish in public, Jess. It's, you know, <laughs> so I'll tell you to decide. Two, two quick stories about rape uh, from my recent uh, past. I, <laughs> this I, will be it. <laughs> no, 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 not, not personal <laughs> cases. Uh, so I, I did a, a clip uh, on a woman uh, that is trying to push forth in the United States, I think maybe in New Jersey, I can't remember exactly where, this idea of rape by fraud. Uh, she has been personally aggrieved by a man who was, you know, a charlatan who lied about who he was and so on. And so I guess that was sort of the, the catalyst that sort oh, of... Oh, by deception, do you mean? Exactly. In, he he exactly. comes along and says, I'm a millionaire. Would you like to sleep with me? And exactly. she says, oh, I do. Exactly. So I'm a millionaire and uh, I'm, a, I'm a venture capitalist and I'm a neurosurgeon and, and I, I love you and I'm not married. And he, of course he is and so on. And so she, she started this whole thing about rape by fraud. You can go check it out. And so I did a clip, uh, you know, a sad truth clip where I was criticizing that whole idea and I was kind of pushing it to the extreme saying, well, I mean, look, when when women falsely advertise their morphological features uh, by wearing push-up bras and so on, well, and then I sleep with them thinking that they have, uh, then that's, they just raped me, right? Uh, yeah, I raped you. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I kind of pushed it to, to satirize it and so on. But I mean, mm. I was, it wasn't an attack on her. I, I, only, I only sort of put a link to her site because I have to sort of reference so that people know that this is real, right? So yeah, she true. so she comes after me as a enabler of rapists because while I haven't committed rape by fraud by attacking her idea I am sort of giving credence to otherwise charlatans who do sleep with women right so I became a rapist enabler by proxy and then That's she amazing. and then she threatened that she was go it, you know it was libelous and defamatory what I was saying I said listen uh, you, I mean, you must live in an alternate universe where you think that you could put up a official position where you are petitioning, uh, you know, a, a a government body to yeah, uh, to put enact forth an idea, an idea, and that I attack this idea publicly, right? I mean, I didn't attack you. I didn't say falsehoods about you. That is considered libelous. Of course, she eventually went away. So that was my first example of dealing with these types of charlatans. I, I love that sort of tortured logic, though. You know, the, the, the sort of desperate, oh, well, it turns out you're responsible for what these other people do. It's like, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. I, nobody is responsible for what they do apart from themselves. Exactly. You know, attacking your bad idea is it's necessary. You know, it should be done. It shouldn't be something. And, and that's the thing. She comes straight for you. She doesn't go for your criticism. It, well, exactly. She goes for you. Exactly. You know? and, but yeah, sorry, Annie, I didn't yeah. jump in. No, no problem. So the, the second example, and I, I don't think we've discussed this on your show. I, I hope we haven't. If we have, I apologize for the repetition, sure. but it's, it's worth repeating. It's a great story. Uh, so I, I did another clip where I looked at a, I was summarizing a study that had come out of Israel where a, I think she was a graduate student at the time, had gone to look at incidents of rape by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, on uh, Palestinian Arab women, right? And she wanted to document that. To the, she's Jewish, I think, mm-hmm. but she's sort of super leftist, so it's self-flagellation, we're oh. evil, and so on. They're lovely, they're, they're, they're gentle, and oh, yeah, we're yeah. the evil there's, there's not a Palestinian alive who'd do something nice who, who do, exactly. to a Jew. Exactly. <laughs> and, and if they do, it's only because of how what the evil juice has done to them. But oh, anyway, yeah, someone else is responsible for that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so she goes out, does a study, and finds that there isn't a single instance of documented rape by 
IDF soldiers on Palestinian women. Not a single case, right? So now you would think, wow, that's really compelling evidence that, that's <laughs> contrary to her thesis. Guess what? There's she a conspiracy could, involved here somewhere. No, no, guess, guess, guess what she concluded. Let's see if after all your, your YouTube clips on SJW thinking, you could come up with your best SJW uh, idea. Well, what, I, I would think that she would say that this is some sort of patriarchal, uh, probably Jewish conspiracy to not report rapes of Palestinian women. So there, there would be some suppression of this information by the, the, the Jewish patriarchy against the Palestinians. Is that close? Good attempt, but clearly you haven't been sufficiently inculcated with lunatic SJW thinking. Here is what she said. And what, what I'm going to tell... By the way, I said this story to an elderly Jewish woman uh, at a cafe where I sometimes go and hang out. And I told her yeah. that story. She started crying how perturbed she was. Now watch, watch what the story is. The fact that there isn't a documented case of rape by the IDF demonstrates how racist and bigoted the Jews are because they so dehumanize the other that they don't even consider them as possible objects, as targets of rape. So it turns out that to not rape is a form of dehumanization and racism. Yeah, that's it. Take it all in, baby. Take it in. <laughs> that's amazing. That is just... Right? I mean, it's just—it's impossible, right? I mean, look, you—you're—you're you're an ex, you're an expert on SJW thinking. Yeah, you couldn't so. generate that hypothesis, right? You couldn't generate that idea because it is so diabolical. It is so contrary to human decency and human reasoning that the typical person. Uh, by the way, I have given this challenge. I, you know, I've recounted the story on many occasions, both privately and publicly, and no one has yet been able. To, to, to guess that to result. Guess that no, yeah. So imagine how diabolical you must be, how self-hating you must be to be able to generate that idea. It's, it's breathtaking, right? I, on, honestly, I mean, th that is genuinely incredible to think that you they don't even view them as humans, so they don't even take the efforts to oppress or rape them. You, you know, is in the I you know I, I don't I don't oppress a cat. Because it's not, you know, human. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to enslave someone, I wouldn't, you know, if I was like, all right, I want a slave labor force, it wouldn't be partially made up of dogs, cats, and horses and people. You know, you would automatically leave the dogs, cats, and horses out because they're not people. And that's what she thinks that the Jewish people in Israel are doing to the Palestinian woman by not raping them. Exactly. And of course, of course, I mean, from a, from a strict sort of talking about falsification, how would you falsify oh, the premise? It's a complete Kafka trap. Exactly. It's either true or it's really true. <laughs> right. You know? If yeah. I don't if I don't rape anybody, I'm a racist pig because I marginalize the other. If if you did find that I rape, then I'm a pig because look, I'm raping the you other. You raped. So yeah. so there is no state of the event where the Jew doesn't come out to be a racist pig. Boom, we're yeah. done. Yeah, exactly. You know, jobs are getting stamped out peer reviewed past. <laughs> you know, now now we need a now we need about a dozen articles about this now. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, so let's let's move on to uh, uh, this. Actually, is something that uh, an, a topic that uh, someone had suggested I speak to you about. I mean, I, I oh. knew of it, but I hadn't thought about talking to you about it. The mm -hmm. whole referendum that's upcoming with uh, Brexit. Brexit. Wow. How do you, how yeah. do you pronounce it? Bre Brexit. Brexit. Okay. Just uh, Brexit is right. the colloquialism. Right. Uh, what would you What would you like me to? Well, so once, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you've have you covered it on your show at all. Maybe you could give us. I've, a... I've covered it a couple of times. Oh. I've done a live stream about it, and I've I've done a brief video about it because th there's a problem with the amount of propaganda that's being pumped out. There there are there are just so many nonsense things being pumped out, and they're picked up by middle class liberal virtue signalers who want to show everyone just how progressive they are by demanding we give up democracy and i'm baffled by this because the, the eu is not democratic in the way we understand democracy i mean we i, I people in the anglosphere tend to understand democracy as the ability to vote for the people who make the laws i mean that that's fundamental that you you can't really have a democracy where you're you're not voting for the people who are making the laws that you have to live by so because you are, then you're not you're for uh, Britain leaving the EU. Yes, very yeah. much so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because good. actually, it, good it, because I think that's how that's where I would stand too. Uh, well, I, it, it's about it's about basic like liberties, really. I mean, you, you, I can't imagine being in a state where I wasn't voting for the people who made the laws. I mean, that's 
why would, you couldn't call that a democracy? You know, you could maybe call it an oligarchy or something, but it's certainly not a democracy. And so th this is how the EU works. You, you have the European Commission, and then you have the uh, European Parliament. And we vote for the people who end up in the European Parliament. And they get to vote on legislation, yes or no, but they don't get to create or propose or repeal legislation. So that's all done by the Commission themselves, and I don't get to vote for the Commission. Therefore, I'm having laws made by people I can't remove from power. I'm having laws made for me by... And the, the people who represent me can't change these laws. They can't repeal them, they can't modify them, they can't make them. And so, I mean, that, that gives us no power of the EU. We can't, we can't for example, if, if European, the, the demos of Europe, decided I I independently that they wanted to send their MEPs to the European Parliament to get the, Euro the European Union to audit itself... We couldn't do it because, I mean, even if we sent everyone sent a Eurosceptic MP to the European Parliament with, with the desire to get the whole thing reformed, if we can't make the Commission create legislation that would require it to audit itself that we could then vote on, there's no vote, you know, that we can't, we can't force them to do that. And so, I mean, and they're never going to do that. The, the, the whole, the, there is a distinct ideology in the political class of Europe, which is, very elitist, obviously anti-democratic, and it's there's a desire to create a single European state, which is why they have a flag with none of the other countries on. It's a unique flag. They've got an anthem. They've got their own internal. They've, they've got their own external borders in the Schengen zone, and then they. It turned out there was a leak to the Times, so a reputable publication, that um, <clears throat> they'd basically been holding back. This they were before we knew when we were going to do the Brexit, they were pushing forward with the idea. And people were kind of poo-pooing it, going, Well, they're not going to do this. But they want to create a European army that's not made up necessarily I mean, it will be made up of the nationals of the countries, but it won't be beholden to any individual country. It won't be like a coalition army, which is what they have now. They do have like European forces, but they're very small and most of them are, you know, national forces. And this frankly, I find this to be a very worrying development. Because you want your soldiers to be invested in the nation they come from. Because that prevents a charismatic general marching on your country and installing himself as a dictator. If they, I mean, there are, there are so many examples of this throughout history. I mean, you can, you can look from any, any ancient Greek tyrant basically establishes their tyranny in the city-state through mercenaries. People who don't care about the population. People who are being paid by the tyrant and not the state. And they end up obviously occupying and oppressing. I mean, Agathocles of Syracuse is one of the most successful of these. I, I do suggest people Google it, because, I mean, it's a brilliant life story, and he does exactly this. And then you've got, like, the Marian reforms in Rome. These, these are what really led to the, the civil wars in Rome, because suddenly, before the Marian reforms, all of the soldiers owned property, and they were Roman citizens. And so they had a voice. They had a tribune in the Senate, the tribune of the plebs. At the very least, you know, the lowest of them had a voice in the government. It wasn't a very big one. But they had some kind of influence. And they were being, obviously, they, they did receive soldier pay, but it was from the state. Then the Marian reforms all changed all of that, where he decided to just adopt commoners as the soldiers. Everyone, there was no property requirement to join the army. And so these people had no loyalty to the state. They, they stood to lose nothing if, say, Marius decided to march on Rome. They stood to gain a lot of money from Marius sacking the treasury and doling out to the soldiers and making them effectively mercenaries. And this, from this point onwards, this is why this is the direct path that leads to Caesar ending the Republic. It was inevitable from that point onwards. And so it's, it's inevitable, in my opinion, historically, from a historical perspective, that giving an unaccountable body a private army that could be very easily used to quell rebellion. I mean, you could, you could hire poor people from Eastern Europe Give them lots of money, lots of training, and a promise of, a, you know, that they're doing the right thing. Propagandize them against the people that you're going to end up having, you know, say a revolt in France could be oppressed by people from, like, you know, Eastern Europe who don't even realize what's going on because they've been propagandized. I mean, every soldier is propagandized against the enemy. You have to. And so these people could be occupying France. They don't speak the same language. They don't know any of the people there. They've got no roots or connections or anything like that. That... You would, I, I would, I mean, it's just such a bad idea. Even if it didn't happen, just the fact that the possibility is open to happening is a terrible idea. It's you would, 
it's just a it's just silly you know but it's just we, ripe for exploitation I, I mean we don't need to come up with hypothetical examples we could look at actual concrete case let's oh. say the immigration problem that is happening yeah. right uh, a, you know a lot of a lot of countries are saying look we, we don't want this number or we don't want any and then there is sort of the superpower that says no 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 we're going to dictate right right and that's that's a problem right i mean so oh, absolutely. i saw i saw a clip i don't know if you know who he is do you know do you know a gentleman by the name of pat condell oh yes very yeah. good fun. yeah so he he recently uh, i think maybe his last clip was sort of a plea a very passionate Sorry, yeah. plea yeah you saw it right he's and very good he, he's he's just incredibly compelling if if only there was a way that this bastard could come on my show then we could really air it. I wish. I would love to talk to him, but he, yeah, he, he doesn't, doesn't seem he doesn't to talk take, to anyone. He doesn't take any interviews whatsoever. No. Uh, I've tried. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, in, in Quebec, we face, I mean, not exactly the same issue, but you, you may or may not know that, uh, you know, Quebec is in a very unique situation in the context of North America because they're the only sort of French-speaking place in a greater sea of evil English language, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they're very... I say they because all, even though I'm perfectly fluent in French, I don't share sort of this fear that I'm going to be subsumed by a tsunami of, of <laughs> English. But so they've come up with all sorts of mechanisms, they meaning the, the Quebec culture, yeah. to try to protect itself from this greater sort of English uh, danger. Uh, and one of the things that they've often tried to do, or at least officially twice, was to have these referendums in 1980 and in 2005 to try to break free from the rest of Canada and become an independent country. Oh, I, I have heard about you, this. Actually. I don't know anything about it, but I've heard that it's happened. Yeah. So in nineteen, now it's a, it's a sort of, it's a very interesting uh, reality, uh, and I wonder how that fits within the referendum that you guys are facing now, because it, it it seems as though they hold this referendum, then the the population votes no, so the majority wins that we should not secede from Canada. This happened in nineteen eighty. Then they waited a few years till 2005, took the vote again. Now, if the vote would have been yes, it's final. And we yeah, see, we don't need another vote right, now. Yeah, right. Yeah. But if they fail, <clears throat> which they did just yeah. barely, it was almost within, I think, one point of difference, not even. Uh, if they fail, well, wait till things change. And so keep taking the vote democratically until you get the, the desired outcome that you want in which case all ballots are closed forevermore and so i yeah. wonder if this is going to be a similar thing that happens here where if, well what do you think i mean what, what well yeah i mean we, we we know the eu will do that i mean the lisbon treaty is just the the er example you you couldn't get any more black and white the irish were asked to vote on the lisbon treaty it wasn't called the lisbon treaty it was called something else at the time but uh, they just repackaged it and called it the lisbon treaty and made them vote on it again it was exactly the same and they they were literally saying, well, that's the wrong choice. And you, you get people like the president of the European Commission, John, John Claude Juncker. He, he literally says things like, we, you know, we'll, we'll vote on it. And if they say yes, we'll continue. And if they say no, we'll continue. They don't care. The, right. Democracy is an obstacle to what they're, they're trying to achieve, which is a hegemonic European super state, which I don't want to be a part of because... So Sorry, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I just look at history. The, the, last, the last 200 years of history has produced some terrible, terrifying European tyrants. You know, and, and it's, there is a distinct ideological difference between the sort of individualistic liberalism of Britain and the continental, more collectivist liberalism of Europe. There is, there's just a difference. There's, there's, just a more, there's more of a respect in the sort of Anglosphere for the individual. And on the continent, there's more of a respect for authority and prestige. And they, it, it's hard, I, you know, I, 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 it's hard to qualify. It's hard to, it's hard to give a good demonstration of. But I, I do think that Europe is basically that demonstration where people in Britain are complaining that they're not being heard and, you know, they're not being listened to. They're not, they're not having their individual democratic rights upheld. And the people on the continent are just saying, we don't care. The, the, the EU are just saying, we don't care. I mean, Britain is constantly outvoted in these proposals. You know, they're, they're also one of the one of the most common Remain arguments here is, well, we'll stay and change it from the inside. And it's like we're always outvoted. I think it's something like uh, fifty-five votes that we've had at this point. Every single one of them, we've been on the losing side. Well, you it's know, basically we the same idea when in the United Nations you have a trillion uh, condemnations of Israel 
but none against any of the endless brutal dictatorships uh, well, because yeah. because you've got 57 countries well 56 countries plus the Palestinian yeah. territories that make up the OIC the Organization of Islamic Conference biggest voting bloc and so whenever you're going to put something to the vote we know how it's going to turn out so same thing is happening in the EU right yeah absolutely and but you know good thing that Saudi Arabia are on the human rights Council. yeah yes yes that's yes. that's a good thing yes, yes <laughs> there's they, nothing funny there you know? I, 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 I think, yeah, so but basically I'm very much out and uh, I I imagine that they're not going to just let us go. I mean, they, they, they've, there's already talk of punitive measures with trade deals, and this has led to this, uh, this thing in Britain we call Project Fear, where they, they basically think the sky is going to fall. They think that the fifth largest economy and military on Earth is incapable of living without being, uh, surviving without being attached to the impoverished states of Eastern Europe. They think that our economy is going to collapse, that everything, the sky is going to fall, that, that you know, UFOs will come down and burn down the House of Parliament, all the sort of ridiculous things, because we don't let Brussels make our laws. And, I mean, I have seen, like, scientists for the EU saying, well, you know, we won't be able to do any research. And it's like, are you, are you serious? The UK is a major contributor to the Large Hadron Collider. We, we, we put millions into that. We're not going to stop paying for that, you know. And you can't afford to let us not pay for that. So even if we leave... You need us to give you money for that, and we want to give you money for that. We can still collaborate on science. We can still do trade. You know, the, it's ridiculous. They think that the world's going to basically implode and the country will just collapse. And in fact, I think it's going to be the opposite. I mean, there, there will be a, a depreciation of the currency initially, of course. You know, uncertainty creates a downward pressure in the markets. It's fine. I understand that. But in five years' time, once we've, and one, the, one of the major problems we have with Europe is regulations. The more and more regulations you have, the more difficult it is for small businesses to get off the ground because they need to make sure that they're within all of these regulations because the penalties are usually fines, which isn't a problem for a mega corporation. They can not only employ someone to follow all these regulations and check it all over. So, you know, when, when you've got, and, and I'm not joking, they, they can literally have hundreds of regulations on mundane items, like a toaster has something like 116 regulations for a toaster. You know, so if you wanted to make toasters, you've got a lot of boxes you need to check. Um, not a problem for a giant corporation. They can, hire a, they can hire a team of people to make sure they're within these regulations. They can take any hits to, you know, if, if they were somehow contravening one, they'll absorb a few thousand or a few, a few hundred thousand euros fine. You know, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation. But a small company can't do that. Because, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you've, you, you're working with two or three other people, you've got a product, you're selling it, you're very busy all the time because you're the ones doing all the work. You, if you've got hundreds of regulations to check through, there's a good chance that you'll miss something. And then if you miss something, you get hit with a massive fine that will quite likely collapse your company. So that will bankrupt you. So it's, it's one of those things where it inherently favors big business against the entrepreneur, which is a more... Which is, which is what we want people to be. This is how you can really grow an economy, by getting people to create their own businesses, generate their own wealth, you know? And what you can do, and, and I'm not suggesting, and, oh my God, this, this is another thing that I keep hearing. They keep, they keep saying things like, well, we won't have any workers' rights. It's like, no, we had workers' rights before we joined the EU. Oh, we won't have any women's rights. We had women's rights before we joined the EU. We won't have, they, they basically will list all of these, you know, civic rights that we won't have according to them when we leave the EU. And it's like, are you insane to think that these things come from the EU? We invented these. <laughs> we invented the idea of individual rights. All of this comes from Britain. You know, the idea that we'll just suddenly abandon it or throw it all out and say, you know, you know what? don't worry about it. You know, this, this just, it's ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous fear mongering. And I, I really hope we leave. I really do. I'm just so tired of it. I, I think your position is clear. Um, so I'm very on. passionate about it because <laughs> I'm British. Hey, Br hey <laughs> Sorry. Passion, passion is good. Uh, it's, yeah. So let's talk about a, a possible danger to all those wonderful ideals that Britain has come up with, and that is the uh, increased immigration that is coming into Britain from folks who otherwise might not share some of your uh, wonderful liberal secular values. Uh, so I had uh, recently, well, in the past few months, several people whom you might know, and specifically because they're British, one mm -hmm. Anne-Marie Waters. Do you know who she is? Anne-Marie Waters? She, uh, she, no, she, she, she's, uh, she's the director of uh, Sharia Watch UK. She, oh, really? She did an Oxford, uh, one of those Oxford debates yeah. uh, that got, you know, went viral. And so I had her on the show. 
I also had uh, persona non grata himself, Mr. Tommy Robinson. Yes, I did as well. Yes. Did you right? And then I also had someone who didn't have the privilege of entering Britain because he was banned, Robert Spencer. And so we, we've discussed things like the Rotherham case and all sorts of problems, the Sharia no-go zones and the Sharia course and so on. So from your perspective today, uh, how are things looking along those fronts in Britain? Okay, well, there are a few there are a few issues with mass immigration that it don't matter whether they're Muslim or not, and I, I say Muslim specifically because I mean even a few months ago even Tony Blair came out and said we're we're importing people who are fundamentally incom- who hold views that are fundamentally incompatible with our own. Someone's going to have to change their views on the subject here because you can't run this sort of dual society, which is what's happening, and it, they're they're becoming effectively colonies in some areas. Where they have their own legal systems, they're like say the no go areas, and it's worrying, very worrying. But there, there's there there are other problems with mass immigration anyway. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, my 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 family's working class, and so I understand from their perspective that mass immigration means extra competitions for jobs. And now at any one time we have about seven hundred thousand free jobs in the UK, and, and it, like every month, you know, if you I mean it goes up and down, but it's uh, roughly seven hundred thousand. But at any one given time, we have about 1.3 million unemployed. And so what's the point of, in, of allowing mass immigration? All you're doing is creating extra competition for the few jobs that exist. It's almost a two-to-one ratio anyway. You know, what do you want to do, make it three-to-one so it's even harder for a British person to get a job? You know, it's, it's madness. It's absolute madness. And that it's unsurprising that the, the working classes are very much against mass immigration regardless of where it comes from. You know, they don't care if it comes from Poland. They don't care if it comes from Turkey. They don't care if it comes from Saudi Arabia. They, don't, they just don't care. It, it's the fact that the numbers of people, low-skilled workers, who are taking their, well, not taking necessarily, but competing with them for low-skilled jobs. But not only that, it depresses wages. It, if, you, if you want to, I mean, it's, it's literally just market logic. If you have an excess of labor, labor becomes cheap. If you have a shortage of labor, labor becomes expensive. I mean, <clears throat> It's very. I can only think of two times when mass immigration in European history was a useful thing. The first one being after World War II, when the Germans allowed a lot of Turkish people to immigrate because they were obviously very much down on manpower. And in England after the Black Death, where the peasants, I mean half the population almost of England died. And so the landlords that were surviving needed people to carry on gathering crops and whatnot, you know, looking after animals. And the peasants started saying, no, you're going to pay us more. And the king had to write an edict to determine the maximum amount a peasant can earn from a landlord to stop them from bankrupting the lords. And it was literally that he had to intervene in the market in a very primitive sense uh, to prevent this because market logic is immutable. You know, you, you can't get around the fact that if you've got an excess of labor, labor becomes cheap. It's just what, how could it become expensive, you know? And this, I mean, this is probably one of the reasons why we need minimum wage laws. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm no economist, but this is just common sense. So, but there's the distribution. So, if you if you were to look at a hundred uh, immigrants slash refugees coming into Britain at any given time, how many will be from cultures and backgrounds that well, are liberal, which is well, a that, euf- that, which is which is a euphemism in this case for Islamic countries. Yes, that that I mean, that's that's the second problem with mass immigration is where it's coming from. I mean, I mean, and to be honest with you, I actually do consider that as a secondary problem initially, you know, but the more that come, the bigger a problem it becomes. Because, I mean, we, we, have, we have just begun an investigation into the more than 85 Sharia courts in this country. And it's done on the premise of, are these Sharia courts upholding women's rights? And this is being done by the Conservative Secretary, uh, Home Secretary, Theresa May. And they... they c- Sorry, I don't know why my phone's going off, but I'm just going to turn it off. Sorry about this. No worries. I, I, I thought it was on silent mode, so I don't know why. I don't know why it's making all this noise. Oh, oh. Right. So yeah. Um. So yeah. So it's done on the premise that um we want to know whether they're upholding women's rights, and I just want to stop them right away. No, we know they're not. We. What is going on with you? Sorry, I have no idea what that is. I sm- um, I smell a Jewish conspiracy. Yeah, it's it's the Jews. No. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we can stop her right there. We know that they're not. I mean, it's codified in Sharia law 
that a woman's opinion is worth half of a man's opinion when, say, giving witness testimony, you know, or, or in any, anything, anything when it comes to any kind of social sphere, like inheritance. I mean, you know this, obviously. You know, when it, when it comes to like, inheritance, women get half the portion of a man. And it's, it's just, and obviously none of this is going to be upholding secular British values and, you know, egalitarian values. And so we already know that there are going to be various violations. I mean, 22% of um, Muslim women in Britain don't even speak English. You know, they've got a very authoritarian mindset when it comes to women. Well, it's racist for you to expect them to speak the language. I, I know. Say, you know what I mean? I you're, you're imposing your linguistic hegemony. That's, that's wrong. I know. That's terrible. You know, we're not letting them oppress their women as they would do at their own country. Racist. You know, it, we're, we're so, we are we're terribly racist that way. It's, it's awful. But at least we're not misogynist. <laughs> well, so, based on the tweet you sent to that MP, I, I reserve judgment on hey, that. Hey, that wasn't a threat. You know, that wasn't a threat. That was a bit of trolling, but that wasn't a threat. <laughs> so, what do you. But the, the, yeah, well, this, this is the thing, yeah, with the, the Muslim women, 22% of them don't speak English. They're, they're trapped in these sort of very insular communities. I mean, the, the, like I said, there are no guerrillas. They are acting effectively as small colonies and regions of cities. It's not the entire cities or anything like that. They're all they're still all minorities in the cities, but they're very interesting. And this is where we get the problem mosques springing up, where in a mosque where a lot of Muslims don't really have that much interaction with non-Muslims, they end up finding themselves with say radical preachers who will start indoctrinating young men and probably women with these sorts of more Islamist ideas, and it causes problems. I mean, you, you get you you there are properly cosmopolitan areas and cities where you have mosques that aren't preaching this. You know, it's not all of them. And so the, these are fine. You know, they're okay. They're not causing any problems. But it's when you get this sort of conglomeration of people who all share say, the same ideology, and then you get the people who say, right, well, we're going to do the fundamental version of this ideology. I mean, what? how can you resist that? How can you say no? So, like, well, we, we only want you to do it a little bit. You know, they're going to be like, well, you're not doing it properly, are you? Are you a Muslim or not? And they'll say, well, of course I'm a Muslim. Well, I guess I've got to let you do the fundamentalist thing. And, you know, you've got to let the hardliners act in the hardline way. It's like, it, it's like a, a hardliner for free speech. You know, I don't necessarily agree that hate speech is unacceptable. I, and I'm not as hardline as some people, but I don't disagree with the people who are hardline on saying, no, we have to have even hate speech. I just shrug and go, well, you know, I, I can compromise on the idea of hate speech as long as it's being reasonable, as long as it's very well defined. I can compromise on that. But, but I don't as, resent those people as, saying it's unacceptable. As long as you don't incite violence i think or the old yeah. fire in the in, the, in yeah. the theater i think everything goes this I've, I've i've gone on record many times saying that look i mean i'm jewish and if there's almost nothing as grotesque as somebody who who says that you know the holocaust didn't happen and yet mm. i support the right for some holocaust des the denier to come to universities yeah. and spew his bullshit uh and you know Absolutely. so so you know you can't be partially pregnant but you're what, pregnant what, or what not. i think they mean by hate speech is calling calling people saying nigger or something right you know they they, they would want you know if, if you called someone a nigger on social media they would want to arrest you which they do do increasingly these days well i'm actually i'm not a fan. i'm very very much against that because yeah listen, I, i'm a very much against arresting people for what's been you know on social media. and you know people are assholes and let them suffer the social consequences of of their hatred and their racism but you don't have the state punishing you for being an asshole, right? I mean, look, yeah. I, I've given this example in the past, but I'll give it again. Uh, I used to be a very competitive soccer player. If I told you the type of trash talking that went in on a soccer field, 95% of the players would be in jail after every game. Yeah, I've got okay? no doubt. Uh, so, so, I mean, what, you know... Uh, yeah, you know, the, 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 this is my thing. I mean, I, I don't like it in any way, shape, or form, but it's something I could compromise on. If I were going to get something in return, you know, if, if I was go if I was talking to a regressive and, you know, we were like, right, OK, we're going to make a deal. I won't call you an ex and you will never say that I can't say something else. You right. know, I could make that concession, but that doesn't mean I'm happy with the concession. And if someone like yourself, I, I actually have respect for the fact that you are refusing to compromise on that issue. You know, that's that's something that I, I agree with you. You know, I do agree with you. But for a more pragmatic and easier right. life, I would probably go, well, as long as it doesn't go any further, you know. Right. But that, and, that, and that, I think, is the attitude that a lot of these Muslim communities have towards the Islamists. Go it's not that they disagree with what they're doing. It's that they're not necessarily... It's hard work right. being that hard line, you yeah. know. And they're just like, well, 
Yeah, I got you. Uh, you know, I've interviewed on my show a lot of, uh, you know, very heroic, courageous, uh, either secular Muslims, secular liberal Muslims, or yeah. ex-Muslims. And many of them, regrettably, have the following uh, bent. And that is that they uh, construct in their minds a, what I call, unicorn Islam, whereby their version of Islam is actually the true version. So, for example, if they happen, oh. if, if they happen to be gay, then they will tell you, uh, you know, if you really look carefully and accurately at Islam, it's actually very pro-homosexuality. And it's only sort of the distortion of the Islamists and the wrong reading of Islam, that right? Or somebody loves Jews who's Muslim suddenly, you know, there's really no evidence of it. If, if, it's, if it's in the text, then it can be interpreted that way. So you have to understand that will happen. I know, you know? but, but, but my, my, my point yeah. is that, you know, ultimately, I think for some of these problems to be resolved, the people who are within the religion, who are otherwise on the side of secularism and liberalism, have to be slightly more honest in their discourse. Now, I don't know if they're being dishonest or whether they're just to protect their, their identity. I think it's fine. Exactly. Yeah. And so I usually, and I've even had people who write to me privately and in some cases publicly where they say, well, why didn't you push this guy a bit harder? Because whatever he was saying was just a bunch of mental gymnastics. And I'm always conflicted because on the one hand, yes, I want to prod them so that I can convey the message that I'm telling you now. But on the other hand, you also don't want to take otherwise a person who is in the same camp as you, right? Who is trying his hardest to reform yeah. some of the really problematic parts of his religion and make him your enemy because you're confronting him very frontally and so it's a very yeah. delicate balance to try to yeah. hit with somebody right yeah it's about knowing when to pick your battle yeah. isn't it? You know? and, and i agree with you a lot of the time it is a no true scotsman you know they, where they say well that person's not really a muslim it's like well they're going to say you're not really a muslim now <laughs> you know and then we haven't advanced anywhere have we but if you are promoting the same values as me that's fine you know we we can we can settle that when we know that this battle has been won right you know? exactly that's that's my opinion. That's that's basically what I t try. You know, try to be a bit more pragmatic. About I, I try. It. I try to 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 sort of uh, do exactly that with Majid Nawaz, but his mm. his response was not very conducive to a dialogue because he sort of took it as a personal uh, attack. Because I was basically saying that look, I, I I find that his project is very laudable and it's wonderful and and, and all those. Uh, yeah, William are doing great work, I'm right? Sure. Except yeah. that some of the doctrinal elements of what he is considering a path to reformation i thought from a doctrinal perspective were complete nonsensical they were bullshit and that you were sort of selling snake oil now i didn't put it in this language i put it in very gentle language but he didn't he didn't like it because any disagreement with him meant that you were part of the enemy and i don't think that's very that's not a very good way to handle this i think we're no. all on the same side uh, let's iron out some of our details but ultimately, we're all fighting for the same things. Right? Yeah, I mean, there are. I think we, we, we uh, you know, we're going to have to accept that there are things on which we're going to have to agree to disagree. Right. You know, and, and like like you were saying with that, the points with Nishi Nawaz, the, the I, I mean, you know, you, you have to be pragmatic. You know, there's no point. I mean, you, you can hold your principles till the very end and say, no, I'm not compromising on a damn thing. You know, this guy's wrong. I'll never work with him because he's wrong on this one thing that we're not discussing. But we're discussing this other thing. You know, and if we work together, we could win this other battle. But you know, he would still be wrong on this point. It's like, okay, you know, that would that's a silly, silly way of looking at things. Right. You know, it, and you, you're you're only stunting your own progress right. by doing. That. You right. know, you've got to you've got to be pragmatic. And I would rather be at odds with Majid Nawaz on that point than be at odds with Majid Nawaz and ISIS on their <laughs> point. You know, or you know, the Islamists and one of the Salafists. Right. You know, I, I I would rather be at odds with him rather than them and him. So you know, what's, you've just got to be realistic. What's going on, by the way? Two more things I want to ask you. Uh, by the sure. way, I can, of course, I can keep you here for three hours. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the only the only reason why I don't do longer podcasts is because it takes me an infinite amount of time to somehow upload them on uh, on <laughs> on YouTube. Maybe you've got yeah. a better system, and so I usually no, try I to... do them live. I do them live. Oh, that's it right. Takes You're too long, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I try to sort of average about an hour. Uh, so yeah. number one, what's happened to your main man, Russell Brand? He's disappeared. The great thinker, the, the luminary, the, the giant, the philosopher, the thinker. What's happened to him? Where is he? You know, R Russell Brand is not as bad as he's portrayed, but he's not nearly as good as people would like him to be. 
And he's, his heart's in the right place, and I think he could be persuaded if sat down with someone who knew how to talk to him. But uh, I, I don't know what's happened to him. I know he shut down his million subscriber YouTube channel and decided to pack it in. Uh, I couldn't tell you what happened. Okay. But um, it, it's, it's a shame because sometimes he had a good point. Other times I could laugh at him. You know, I, I feel like I've lost out both ways there, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I, at one point I was going after uh, Russell Brand when he sort of uh, came up with 73,000 different reasons why, uh, you know, the, the, the Muslim extremists do what they do, but, but none of which had anything to do with Islam. Oh, and, of course, and, it's never. <laughs> right. And more recently, I, I switched. And people think that the, I have a personal animus to these folks. I couldn't, I couldn't give a damn about them. I'm critiquing their ideas or whatever they publicly state. So my, my latest uh, bête noire has been uh, Bill Nye. I don't know if you know who that is. Uh, I do know who Bill yeah, Nye is. Yeah, so he's the science guy. Uh, I've been going after him for about six months because he, after the Paris attack, he went on Huffington Post Live and proclaimed that, uh, look, there's a very plausible uh, causal link between what happened in Paris and you know solar panels and carbon emission levels and so on. And so I thought that that was so grotesque that for the past six months, I've been just going after him relentlessly. Now, most people get it. Most people support what I'm doing. A few people, I call them the Nye Rage Brigade. How does he connect the Paris attacks to solar panels and global warming? So usually what happens, the argument is, uh, you know, there was a drought in Syria. That drought in Syria caused failure in crops. That failure in crops uh, resulted in uh, rural people moving to the city. So there was greater... Uh, concentration of people and uh, therefore because of this it you know it created frustration blah 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 right and to which i did a so sad that's incredibly indirect yeah so i did a, i did a sad truth clip where i argued that barry white you know who barry white is the, the yeah, yeah, of course, yeah barry yeah. white is ultimately to blame for the syrian uh, problem because it turns out that uh, bashar al-assad's uh, father and mother decided to conceive uh, Bashir while listening to Barry White music. <laughs> and, and if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that. And now that is literally true. Let's yeah. assume for a second that that is true. Uh, well, that is tr So this, this is what I call the idiotic butterfly effect. Everything <laughs> is connected to everything else. So it's, yeah. you know, so and sometimes my wife will come in and she sees me. I'm I'm doing something on the computer. She's super obsessed. She goes, well, what, what happened now? I said, well, look at this idiot on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I so, can see my wife. So, right? So I basically <laughs> feel like I'm this, this sort of this giant slayer of idiots. Now, if you're a guy that has two followers, who cares? But if you are Bill Nye that has 10 times the reach that you and I have put together. and He can some, get on TV. He can get he, in public debates. He's well, a big guy. Then, then I then I am going to call you on your shit because Absolutely. I do get a bunch of idiots who come on my uh, YouTube channel who ape exactly verbatim the words that he said because he has parasitized their feeble mind with his bullshit. And well, so well, just to interrupt, what really annoys me about that as well, I, I hate this whole chain of reasoning. It's like something happens somewhere else. Therefore, this person deciding to take a terrorist act is not their fault. I mean, it's in, in, the whole thing is a denial of their own agency. Yeah, I was going to say exactly that. No agency. E exactly. You know, this person is a human being with agency. They might be misinformed. They might have some terrible ideas in their head. But at the end of the day, it's nobody else's fault for what they do. You know, even if they've been told these terrible ideas, the onus is on them to know that these are terrible ideas and to obviously know that murdering people is wrong no matter what justification you have. You know, and so, like you said, you could blame Barry White for, you know, Bashar al-Assad, but that would be ridiculous. And it's the same thing. Oh, this famine is responsible. No, the, the famine is responsible for the conditions that created this person's, you know, the, 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 uh, like created the conditions for this person to become exposed to these ideas. Sure. You know, to, to be exposed to the sort of circumstance that might make them want to take action. But it's their own decision to take action that is the thing. And that's, and I, I can't stand the... It's someone else's fault. Right. No, it's not someone else's fault. It's your fault. You know, you did it. You decided to make these decisions. It's like the wage gap with the feminists. It's like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm only earning 77% of what a man earns. It's like, yeah, but you chose to do gender studies. So, you know, if you chose to do particle physics, you wouldn't be having this problem. You know, and so, well, yeah. Well, the fact that, that particle physics gets paid more than women's studies is a manifestation of the endemic sexism. 
It is, of course, patriarchy, you're right. It's patriarchy, yeah. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's another thing that annoys me very much is the demand for the equality of outcome. There was a, oh, there was a video the other day done by a chap called Teal Deer where he was covering a company. I can't remember the name of it. It was a small online company. They, I think they probably only had, like, you know, 20 employees or something. But they, they were very progressive, very progressive. And they decided to audit their company and go, oh, oh, my goodness, the women are earning 8.6% less than the men. And I'm thinking, well, you should all flagellate yourselves for being sexist then. You're the one paying them. But um, they instead decided to simply pay all the women 8.6% more on the basis that they're women. It's like, but how much work are they doing? <coughs> well, we've got... We've got the, Excuse me. Uh, didn't we, matter. We've got the, the, the king of the social justice warriors, the... The, the head, the patriarch. Oh, yes. uh, you know who I'm going for the now? The Pope of Canada. Oh, the there you go. Pope. Just just the Trudeau mm. hair boy. I mean, this guy will make sure that if there is a surgery that's happening somewhere, <laughs> there is equal representation in the room. Wait a minute. Before we intervene on this guy's heart, he's about he's having a heart attack. Do we have gender parity in that in that room? Because <laughs> otherwise, yeah. sorry, buddy, you gotta die I for do. gender diversity. Yeah, I, I'd love to, but we don't have any female doctors around, so you can't get surgery now. Not just that. What? I mean, you've got to have what, what, what? no transgender person in the operating oh. room. Every room should have a microcosm of equal yeah. parity. Otherwise, sorry but to die. The whole thing justifies a really authoritarian mindset, because once you started down this road, why don't you just have an entirely centrally planned economy? You know, you, you say to someone, right, you have to be a doctor here, because you are a fi- you know you're you're a white person they need a white person you're a black person they need a black person it completely eradicates personal freedom right. the the logical conclusion of it i mean and you can never satisfy them they never say well they, they never give you the numbers they want you know if they say well okay let let's say they want it exactly down to the population representation if you've got 5% chinese 3% black or something like that then you would literally have to plan the whole thing to get it right there's no margin where they can say, well, you know, five, ten percent either way would be fine. You know, they don't say that. They they are very elusive, and it's it's all to gain power because it generates, and I think it's generated by authoritarian people, and they think that they're doing the right thing, obviously, but they're not because they have been indoctrinated into these ideologies. But the logical conclusion of it is a terrifyingly dystopian society where nobody has any freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of choice, and freedom of thought. And it's just like, Christ, you know, Orwell couldn't write a scarier society than the society social justice and tolerance and diversity are pushing us towards. I want equality of outcome. Here are three... uh, Uh, Equality of opportunities. uh, Right, here are three sexist outcomes that we have to redress. Uh, Globally, men commit suicide at three to one ratio to women. So we need to address that by having more women committing suicide. Exactly. Uh, number two, uh, men in the, in the United States, but I suspect this could easily translate globally, uh, roughly 90% of occupational uh, deaths are by men. We need to redress that by having more women die on the job. Mm-hmm. And then thirdly, uh, it, you know, a great majority of men who die through violence or people who die through violence are men. So we need to redress that by having more women be killed. Otherwise, there was, there was a perfect example of this in the paper the other day. Okay, uh, it, it was it, it was just hilarious. And I saw the uh, photographs and the taken being passed around social media. It was hilarious. Uh, they were talking about obviously how terrible women have it, and they decided to give the homeless figures. And they it was literally one in four homeless people is a woman. It's like right, okay. So we need more homeless women then. That's what you're saying. What, oh, oh, should we just take care of the women? Don't worry about the men who are homeless. Right. I mean, that's equality. Right. You know, I don't want to sound like an MRA, but that's obviously nonsense. You know, you can't filter. And this fundamentally, this is what really gets me, right? The problem isn't that it's men or women. The problem is that they are homeless. It doesn't matter whether they're men or women. It's like with black people. Oh, black people are too poor to go to university. We should give a black scholarship. It's like, no, that's an argument for a means-tested scholarship based on wealth. It's not an argument to give black people scholarships. It's an, it's an argument to give poor people scholarships. You know, and the, these, and I can only assume it's because they're racist and sexist that they do it. I right. can only assume that because if you have the metric that you're measuring, you're like, oh, you know, under, under X amount of money a year, these people don't go and there are more black people. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. I, mean, I don't want to discriminate against the white people who are also poor. You know, the problem is the poverty, isn't it? Let's right. focus on that rather than the race, you lunatics. <laughs> all right. Having covered all of these topics, I've left 
the most important topic for last, and I hope that you're sufficiently qualified to comment on it. Oh, God. We've got, starting today, Euro 2016. Forget about Islam, forget about immigration, I... <laughs> forget about leaving the EU or not. Let's talk about really important stuff, the true, the one and only true religion that is football. Uh, do we have any predictions? Uh, that you no, like I don't share? follow the football. What? <laughs> I have wasted my time with a guy who doesn't... I knew you'd hate me for that. Should I? Should I? I, should I, I, I know. You? I already know you're a fan because I follow you on Twitter. Obviously, I see your Twitter feed and I see your football oh, uh, updates oh, and stuff. But I, I don't follow it myself. It's only because you have a glorious beard that matches my glory <laughs> that I will not enter you into the Castrati Brigade because <laughs> no self-respecting man or some women should yeah. not be following. Euro 2016, but I'll pass. I'll let you pass for this time. I am so I am, glad I have my beard. I am, I am a merciful, benevolent gad. Uh, <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Stay you on the line. Uh, okay. Guys, please, uh, I don't need to promote his channel. It's unbelievably popular, but check out his channel. I will put it in the descriptor. Thank you so much for joining us. Sergeant. It's been a pleasure to be here with the gadfather. Thank you so much, sir. Stay with me.